I'm Chris Fitzsimon with NC Policy Watch, and we're thrilled that you are all here. Uh, NC Policy Watch is a project of the North Carolina Justice Center, and there are a lot of Justice Center folks here. I won't introduce them all, but I want to introduce Melinda Lawrence, who's the Executive Director of the Justice Center. Um, normally, traditionally, Rob's going to explain a little bit about our courts and law work, uh, but as you know, Policy Watch and the Justice Center does a lot of work uh, on the legislative, in the legislative arena and in the executive branch arena, and boy, aren't those, those going swimmingly well. <laughs> Although I do have some, uh, one brief of, uh, one brief tiny bit of good news, and we take it where we can get it. The House Education Committee this morning uh, was considering a vou voucher scheme uh, and actually ran out of time before the vote. We're hoping that means that the vote on the committee might actually be closed and that we might not uh, have vouchers in North Carolina to take further uh, money away from our public schools. Uh, but today we're here to talk about uh, why courts matter and the work that we're doing in that, in that field. And, uh, please sign up for NC Policy Watch and Justice Center uh, emails and newsletters if you haven't already. Um, if, uh, if you had an opportunity at the door, please stop if you haven't. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Rob Schofield with NC Policy Watch. He's going to introduce uh, our amazing panel. And uh, thank you all for being here. Very few people have Chris's awesome voice, so we're going to use the microphone today. <laughs> Um, if you're here today or watching online, uh, you're probably pretty confident that you know how important the courts are, especially the federal courts. Uh, you know that the U.S. Supreme Court is the final arbiter of a host of controversial issues that confront our fractious and divided country. You undoubtedly also know that in this era of divided government and competing interpretations of the Constitution, both in Congress and at the state level, the courts play an important role in curbing the abuses and overreaches of uh, ambitious executives and legislators. That said, I will wager that many of you are quite unaware of many less well-reported matters of our court system, be it numerous important decisions at our district courts and courts of appeal, to the names and backgrounds of the men and women who serve on these courts, to the ins and outs of the complex process that surrounds the filling of judicial vacancies. Uh, despite the great respect and reliance that both caring and thinking people have for the law and the men and women who ultimately decide what it means, a surprising percentage of us pay only scant attention to the day-to-day -day news from this particular branch of government. The matter of judicial vacancies is one area in particular that seems to generally escape the attention of many people, even progressive advocates and activists. Right now, for instance, here in North Carolina, there's a seat on the federal district court for the Eastern District that has remained vacant for seven years, with scarcely, scarcely a ripple of public attention. In Washington, the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, the court most commonly seen as the nation's second most important tribunal, has had many long-standing vacancies, and the Obama administration has simply been unable to fill as a result of stubborn resistance from conservative senators and lobby groups like the NRA and the religious right. And while none of this is unprecedented, judicial vacancies have frequently been matters of great controversy in our country in recent decades. The plain truth is that the controversy scale has sort of been ramped up in recent years. And when one hears just how difficult it is to become a person to be confirmed on the federal bench, even a moderate to conservative appointee, it becomes increasingly clear that there is a need for people of goodwill and progressive inclination to pay more attention and become more involved in the debate. And it was this realization of this hard truth that led some visionary funders and advocates in Washington in recent years to begin to spur folks at the state level to start working to change this dynamic. And so in recent months, a movement has commenced in several states to significantly increase the attention paid to the courts uh, and the judges who run them. And in some states, this has actually resulted in new coalitions dedicated to promoting and supporting more women and people of color on the federal bench, uh, a club that has long been overwhelmingly white and male. Here in North Carolina, we at NC Policy Watch have helped convene some discussions that may well lead to the formation of such a coalition. But we have also done something that uh, something else that very few, if uh, any other states, are doing around this issue. We've actually hired a crack journalist to actually report on the courts and law news in this state and to fill in the empty space left by the demise of the traditional media and its uh, recent decline. Our operating theory is that if we want people to pay more attention to the courts, we need to tell them regularly what the heck is happening in the courts. And so last fall, my NC, uh, NC Policy Watch was able uh, to add our first courts and law reporter, my colleague uh, Sharon McCloskey. And Sharon has truly hit the ground running. She has produced dozens of important news stories and features that appear at the ncpolicywatch.com website and on our blog, The Progressive Pulse. Sharon herself is an experienced attorney who switched careers a few years back 
went to Columbia Journalism School, and her knowledge and experience show through uh, in each of her stories. And if you haven't already, I hope you'll be taking a look at them and looking for her byline in our weekly emails. So I'm going to actually ask Sharon to come up for just a moment, tell you a little bit more about the work she's doing, and how you can be a resource to her and vice versa. So Sharon, come on ahead. Please welcome her. Thank you, Rob. Uh, you're very kind. Uh, when I came to Policy Watch in the fall, after a few, few short years writing elsewhere and many more years as a litigator in New York and New Jersey, I didn't have to look far for stories about what was going on in the courts and why that mattered for all of us. I started here, coincidentally, on the first Monday in October when the U.S. Supreme Court opened its, own, its new term, a term that, as it's turned out, may just be one of its most historic. In the coming weeks, the court will hand down decisions affecting some of our most personal and fundamental rights, the right to marry in the marriage equality cases, the right to vote in the Voting Rights Act case, and the right of access to equality college education in the affirmative action case. At the same time when I got here, the redistricting case was heating up as the parties took some issues up to the state Supreme Court and the national media began asking questions like, who in the world is our pope and why should anyone care? <laughs> and of course, it was also election season here. And we had a Supreme Court race that turned out to be one of the most expensive ever, with millions of dollars in outside money pouring in to support the re-election of a sitting Supreme Court justice, giving rise again to national attention and raising a very scary question, were judges for sale in North Carolina? We tried to cap capture all of that with the detail gleaned only by living and working right in the middle of it all. And those were the big stories to tell, the ones that make it somewhat obvious for us to understand that we should know who it is we are choosing to serve as judges and why that matters. But there were also the stories, just as important if not more so, that concern the everyday life of the courts and the impact on the people who find themselves there. Why does it take years for my case to get to trial? Can I, under, can I afford to pay that much for justice? What happens when I can't pay court costs and fees assessed against me? Why is my divorce taking so long? Over the past few years, budget cuts to the courts and to the providers of free or low cost services like legal aid and public defenders have made access to justice a hurdle too high for many people. The more cuts are being debated right now in the Senate with little recognition or understanding of how the courts work and what exactly they need to function effectively and efficiently. <coughs> We've told those stories, too, over the past few months, and we'll continue to do so in the weeks ahead. They are the stories that remind us that who the judges are in the cases where justice meets the everyday man matter because of what they bring to the bench. Because as we know, politics aside, Judges are people just like the rest of us, and they come to the bench with preferences and predilections shaped by their own life experiences. And if the courts are going to maintain credibility, the cross-section of judges in that system should look a lot like the cross-section of people that they serve. I have a long list of stories yet to tell, more to come. Um, what's it like to be an unaccompanied minor from Central America navigating the immigration court in Charlotte? our predatory lending and debt collection practices alive and well in North Carolina, uh, and, and many more. And certainly that list will grow even over the, in the next few weeks, since we know after the legislators pack up and go home in June, much of what they may have passed this session, voter ID, school vouchers, laws affecting reproductive rights, limits on pre-K funding, we know where that is all headed, to the courts. So. If you've been following our stories, thank you and keep reading. If you haven't, please do. And by all means, if you have a case, a story, or a tip you'd like to share, we'd love to hear it. Thank you for coming. You can email Sharon at, uh, at ncpolicywatch.com. All right, so in addition, of course, to uh, reporting on the courts, we want to approach this even a little more directly, uh, explain why courts matter and why we all should be paying much more attention to them. And so to help us today, we're honored to have two extraordinary speakers. The first is the Honorable James A. Wynn, Jr., Judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. 
uh, for almost three now, three years now, Judge Wynn has served as a judge of the Fourth Circuit in Richmond, uh, where he has quickly established himself as one of the court's most thoughtful voices. I should also note that Judge Wynn's nomination and confirmation to the federal bench was itself a fairly lengthy process that is indicative in some ways of the tough debate that often surrounds federal judicial nominations. I believe it was 1999 when President Clinton first nominated him. Prior to his current position, of course, Judge Wynn served on both the North Carolina Supreme Court and Court of Appeals. He's a veteran attorney with nearly four decades of legal experience. Wynn is a North Carolina native and a graduate of Marquette University Law School and holds a Master's of Law degrees, Law degree from the University of Virginia Law School. And Judge Wynn's remarks will be followed by comments from Andrew Blockey. Blocky is the director of legal progress at the Washington, D.C.-based Center for American Progress. He's an attorney with extensive knowledge of both federal constitutional litigation and the state of the judiciary itself. He's also one of the national visionaries who helped spark the Why Courts Matter movement. Uh, Blocky joined American Progress after serving as the program manager at the HJW Foundation, where he uh, directed the foundation's progressive infrastructure and legal and public policy programs, as well as the foundation's immigration and poverty alleviation programs. And of course, HJW funds our courts and law work. Previously, from, from 2003 to 2006, Andrew served as the communications director for Senator uh, Ron Wyden, a uh, Democrat from Oregon, and former Representative Jim Turner from Texas. He's a graduate of Stanford University, where he received both his undergraduate law degrees. So, Andrew will go after Judge Wynn, but first, please join me in welcoming Judge James Wynn. Thank you, Rob. I'm not sure this thing is working or not. I'm not, I'm not. I can speak up loud enough. and I'm off the right. It's good to be here with you today. Uh, good to see so many good faces around here, Al. You've been out in the trenches for a long time. Uh, he is what I call the epitome of a lawyer. A guy who will take a case very few others will do it. I've heard him arguing when I was on the state appellate courts, and you know, you're just a super lawyer, and to have a lawyer who gives a damn is really what it's about. <laughs> More so, I mean that in the suit. Yeah. You can't imagine when I go to cocktail parties and to events, the number of people who come up to me with legal problems, and what do you do with them, and, and how do you solve them, and how do you get them access to the court? Real life stuff. Uh, that day-to-day -day ordinary people see, and that is a fair and impartial judge. And I emphasize to you, Melinda and Rob and Paul, who work in this area, Jim, the AFL-CIO, that your focus should be on fair and impartial judges. Focus on that, I submit and move away from ideological concerns. And the reason I say that is because fair and impartial judges are good for America. They're good for conservatives, they're good for liberals, they're good for Republicans, they're good for Democrats. I know this from my international experience. The State Department sent me to countries like Vietnam and to Cambodia to talk about judicial independence. In the Navy, some of you know I spent nearly 30 years in the reserves as a military judge and travel to Japan and different places and talk to a lot of different folks about this and you see the foundational basis of why civics is so important in this country and why that separation of government is so fundamental to what we do and why we all grasp from it and you can call activists in one one vein this but activism really is in the eyes of the beholder depends on the policy in which you, you seek to undertake it. I brought with me two of my law clerks. I have four law clerks. Uh, I like to brag about my young law clerks. They stay with me for a year. Uh, these two happen to be uh, from those split institutions of Duke and Carolina. <laughs> but they were editing chiefs of the law review there, so uh, you get too close to them, you'll start feeling the electricity. Uh, but it's wonderful to be here, A. Jones, uh, my friend of many years. One of the first African Americans to be in a majority white uh, <coughs> law firm, so to speak, and then went on to be a Superior Court judge. And I, I know you can, and we'll be the same kind of lawyer as will be here. Take those tough cases, man. Uh, but I come here today to discuss 
I don't prepare scripts. I gave up giving lectures and speeches a long time ago. <laughs> uh, it's sort of like uh, my friend Winthrop Tiller and I belong to a group, and when we have people to speak, he said, tell us something not on your resume. Hmm. You know, because we can read that. I didn't come here to tell you stuff you can find on Google, so to speak. Or some of it you will be able to find, but some things you probably ordinarily hadn't thought about from the perspective of what it means. Because I try to share with you the advantage of having been in the judiciary now for 23 years in the appellate judiciary on the state court, having run six times on a statewide ticket uh, for the election uh, in this state with the help of Jim Andrews and so many others. And Chris, who uh, supported me all during those years, is amazing that I was able to win that seat. I'm one of the few African-American males to win a seat on a statewide basis. And only Henry Fry won one for the judiciary beyond myself, when you look at it, and then Cliff Johnson. So when you think about that limited type of venue, it's an opportunity to have an experience and to share with you some things about the court that ordinarily you may not know. And I'll tell you, first of all, that the work you're doing in terms of focusing on the importance of the court, you're doing a tremendous, tremendous thing by focusing there. One judge can make a difference. And it's not just the opinions that you read from that one judge. Oh, when I first got on the State Court of Appeals, I'm not <coughs> sure I had the level, I knew I didn't have the level of influence that I did when I left. And so I could dissent quite often now. And they just say, well, that's just Judge Wynn dissenting. <laughs> but when the Supreme Court reversed for eight <coughs> times, based upon the reasons in my dissenting opinions, mm -hmm. I started getting a little respect. <laughs> so you will see in the latter years, I didn't dissent as much. And you say, what caused that to happen? Well, you never know how many times someone wrote a majority opinion. I had an opinion in the opposing view that eventually became that majority opinion. And that name was not there. And it's not just me, it's judges all around. That one judge sometimes, not only the ultimate opinion that comes out, <coughs> could have been much broader. But in order to achieve a consensus on the court, quite often the reason or the rationale is much narrower than what it would have been. So you don't see the direct benefit of that judge on the court, but I promise you, one judge makes a tremendous difference on the court. It may be a difference between whether an opinion is published or unpublished. And what difference does that make? You know, published opinions are the strong precedent. You gotta follow those. Unpublished is just for guidance. You don't have to follow it at all. Many times they aren't followed. Most times they aren't followed at all. It used to be they weren't followed in, in any degree, but now they at least can be there for guidance. So you can see that one judge can make a tremendous difference. I wrote an article some years ago on accountability and diversity in, in, the, in, the, in the confirmation process that Rob talked about. <clears throat> yes, I was nominated in 1999. Uh, your friend Jesse Helms decided that uh, we didn't need any more was his terminology. And this is a lesson for the young folks, because I believe in this strongly. When I was confronted by many during that time with the reality there had never been an African American on the Fourth Circuit. The Fourth Circuit had the largest percentage of African Americans of any court in the country. The Fourth Circuit has an allotment of 15 judges. At one point during my nomination, and I was perhaps for almost two years, the only nominee for that court. And there were five vacancies out of 15. It was a very compelling case. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and given that, North Carolina had no judges on, on the court. And of the five states, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia, North Carolina is the largest of the five states. No judges on the fourth circuit for that time period. And you would think that would be a compelling case. And so I'm confronted with this situation and I learned something in the process. It's the power of politics and how to work with what you have. And if I don't say this, I want to say it to you right now. I believe with every decision and every action that comes down, that Newton Third Law, there's a separate but active opposite reaction, there's something in everything, even when it's against you, that is positive in your direction. And, and I'm, I'm confronted with this situation, Senator Helms has an absolute veto by senatorial policy. Now, why do I say that? Because the two senators from this state, from this state, has to turn in what is called a blue slip. He doesn't have to like you, he doesn't have to vote for you, anything. 
And most of them do it as a matter of course. But if either one of those senators fail to turn in that blue slip, you'll never get a hearing. That's just Senate policy. Not in the Constitution, not in the statutes, not anywhere. That's just Senate policy. And Jesse Ham said he was not going to turn in the blue slip because he didn't need it anymore. He wasn't doing anything illegal. He wasn't doing anything that was against the law. So what was the response from me when I'm asked by media all over the place? And you know the history of Jesse Helms that some may have. And I'm asked by folks from ABC News. I'm all over the place. They want to interview me. They are interviewing me on NPR and everywhere. And ultimately, they reached the question, Judge, when do you believe Senator Helms is a racist? They're expecting this answer to come back to me, of course. <laughs> one package, but what they get back is, of course not. <laughs> Senator Helms is a fine gentleman. He has followed the law, and everything he had shown me, I'm telling you the truth, everything he told me, and, and the way he treated me was with complete respect and courtesy. Now, that kind of threw a lot of my friends off. And, and they want to know, why in the world would you say that? Why would you do that? They even wouldn't let me, the, the ABC News took me off when they found out that I wasn't going to call them a racist. News and Server, I'm just not going to do it. But I figured out something, and this is for you. What I figured out in this process, I grew up in Eastern North Carolina. 1954, I was really, grew up in a, a segregated community. And I kind of understood the way things work in life. Certain things go your way sometimes, some things don't. But I knew this in my heart. If I got up and said Senator Helms was a racist, for about three weeks, I would be a hero. Andrew, they'd have me everywhere you could go around with that. Oh, Judge Wynn is the greatest man in the world, greatest man in the world. And in about three weeks, I was going to slowly fade <laughs> into oblivion. Right. And Jesse Hem was still going to be the senior senator from the state of North Carolina. And the, the takeaway from that in what you do is to see the big picture for where you are. Because if you, if you particularly if you're young, Realize there's another day that can happen. There's a, there's a time period beyond where you are. Everything doesn't have to happen now, but begin to build on that. And so I remained in the state court, served 10 more years in the state uh, court of appeals and the Supreme Court. I remained in the United States Navy, became a military judge, and served 10 years as a military judge during that time period. Became the chair of the Judicial Division of the American Bar Association and the Appellate Judge Conference of the American Bar Association on the Executive Committee of the Uniform Law Commission and had no clue that sometime in, there would be this fellow named Barack Obama who would become president. And my former law partner, who I did not see the connective relationship with G.K. Butterfield, who's in Congress, had established this wonderful relationship of being the only congressman in this state to support him when we started out. Mm -hmm. And that connective relationship, it's amazing. If any of you are religious in here, you can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> but that, that connective relationship of looking beyond and seeing the big picture is what makes your work important and why, even as I hear all of these comments, Bill, about how bad it is now and how terrible, well, isn't this what it's about? I mean, what is life if you don't have a challenge? I mean, if there isn't something to fight out there, if everything's going your way, then what would you do? You'd go home and just go to sleep. <laughs> you know? But there's a challenge here. And when a, in the course of a challenge, you find out what you really made of. That's the folks that will get down into the nitty gritty. And I was very fortunate in, 19, in 2008, the president's folks called me and said that they would be nominating me for the for the for certain. In fact, uh, Chief Justice Burley Mitchell uh, was to head up a particular nominating committee for Senator Hayden. One of the nice things about it from the inception was Senator Burr called, the office called me up right from the beginning. I mean, before <coughs> anything had happened, said his chief of staff down, had lunch with me, and said, Judge Wynn, we will not do to you what was done before. And I, to his credit, he stuck right with it, I'm telling you, right to sitting with us in the hearing and the whole process. It was a tremendous difference of, of, of situations in 2008. But we had a president who had won, and a president who Senator Burr later told me actually came to him before he was sworn in and secured to him secured the, 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 uh, his support for me in that process. And so we had a very unique situation in North Carolina 
Uh, at that time, uh, Allison Duncan had been put on the court. Some of you may know Allison Duncan, who is a very dear friend of mine. But Allison Duncan had, had been my opponent when I first ran for the State Court of Appeals. And I won. And, but I tell you, I didn't really win because Allison Duncan went out to the Utilities Commission, went out in private practice, made a ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> and then she got on the fourth circuit. I stayed on the state court during that time period. But it is, it is a pleasure to work with Allison on the court and the other judges. And I'll speak some more in terms of the collegiality of the court. But that was a that was a critical time, you know. Once in, in, in 2008, after I had been nominated for this, because the president made a decision to also bring on board a Hispanic, never in the history of this court or circuit, which has a lot of 15 judges, has been a Hispanic. I knew when they said he wanted Hispanic who it was going to be because I had known Al Diaz for 20 some odd years. Al Diaz was a colonel in the Marine Corps who was also a military judge and we had worked together. He was also head of the, he was also on the business, business court here, had gone to Wharton School of Business up in Pennsylvania and I could see where this was going. Another judge is coming from North Carolina. I could only see Al Diaz in that seat and sure enough that's what happened. And so they, they held me up a little bit to allow for something to happen that rarely if ever happens now, two circuit court judges going before the Senate confirmation proceeding. And we were prepped for this thing. I mean, you go through your whole background. When I say prep, the Obama administration, unlike previous administration, maybe others, will vet you to the T before you get nominated. And typically, he's going to want to know any of those senators not going to turn into blue slip before you get nominated. So you're probably not going to get it if that's going to happen. But then you go through the process. And the process starts with the FBI agents, who then go through your whole community. By the way, if you've got neighbors, you might want to tell them that. <laughs> Some of them call me up and says, Judge, at least tell me when these guys are coming. They come up to your door and they say, we're from the FBI and we want to talk with you. <laughs> you don't want to hear that. <laughs> And, and then, so then the Justice Department will also vet you, the White House will vet you, and then the American Bar Association vet you. By the way, the American Bar Association is vetting an individual for the Eastern District, even as I'm speaking right now. I won't reveal who it is, but there's someone who the Eastern District, the nomination is, is impending from that district, uh, that, I guess in a moment. So, but once the American Bar Association does probably the most comprehensive investigation of you. Uh, they come down and they probably talk to 200 lawyers and judges and others in the community, but mostly legal types, about your reputation and everything about you. And then, it, actually the guy who was doing it was a friend of mine out of Richmond, and he called me up and he says, Judge, I'm coming down, I need an interview, and we're gonna need about five hours. I said, what in the world are you and I gonna talk about for five hours? I know you. And he came down, and I kid you not, it was five hours he stayed in my office. He was asking everything in the world. Of course, it didn't help that I had been on the court for 20 some odd years and had thousands of opinions out there that everybody could scrutin. And by the way, if you want to be a nominee, the, I hate to tell you this, but the less you've written, probably the better off you are. <laughs> and because anything you've written, and, and when I went before this process, the, the hearing itself, we had prepared as though we were going for the U.S. Supreme Court. Al and I had gone up to the Justice Department. We sat down, Burton, in this meeting with all these justice attorneys, and they grilled us on everything from the Lopez decision to subject matter jurisdiction. Everything. You thought you were back in law school. I mean, it was quick because we were preparing for the works. And so then we go into the hearing, and it just so happened the Affordable Health Care Act is going on at the same time in the Senate. So part of the committee is out there. And lo and behold, Al Franklin is sitting in front of us as the chair of that committee. <laughs> that was nice. Because <laughs> Al Franklin has myself, is, is myself and, and Al Diaz sitting at the table. And we got family and all kinds. It's very formal how you do it. And you don't know what's going to happen. They can ask anything. And they've already asked a number of questions that's going on through the process. And Al Franklin's question was, well, we got a Marine Corps and a Navy guy. How does that do? How do you guys able to get along with each other? <laughs> I looked at Al and I said, I think we can handle this. <laughs> there were some serious questions there, but the really serious question for me came later on because this was in November, or, or at least getting close to that area. Yeah, it was around the November time, November, December time frame. 
And so they said, we're going to send questions after this. And so some of the senators apparently got their staff go through every one of those 2,000 some odd opinions and pulled out cases I had written 18 <coughs> years ago and started asking questions about it. in a very, very narrow way. And then the articles, I thought I was trying to be scholarly, but writing all these law review articles. And, oh, they pulled those things and went through them like crazy. And one of them sent a question to me on the diversity. The word diversity is a buzzword if you write an article. But Senator says, says this, this question is almost, it was offensive. Judge Wynn, why is it that you uh, think that a black defendant cannot get a fair trial on a white judge? And I'm saying, where in the hell did that come from? <laughs> I've never written anything like that. Now look at where it comes in. The, the quote is, is completely, it, you can, it, I'm, I'm not telling you anything that's not known. This is all on public record because these things are all there and my response is all there in terms of what's there. But you can tell what is done. They've taken out a, a small portion of a quote and lifted it and, and extrapolated this yeah. result. And now I gotta respond to that without insulting this US senator because you know, didn't I just tell you? Yeah. You make one US senator mad, you probably not going anywhere. <laughs> so I gotta figure this out. And so uh, we, we were able to massage the answer out and say, Senator, you know, I've never held that belief uh, and would not hold such a belief. Uh, it may be helpful to now show the entire quote. And when you do the entire quote, it comes out something like scholars have looked at issues that concern da 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 da. <laughs> and it was totally not that. And some of the, to the credit of uh, many of the senators, including Senator uh, Jeff Sessions, who was the, the lead one for at that time, the Senate Minority Leader for the Judiciary Committee, being a lawyer, he picked up exactly what was going on and became one of the, the people who voted for me and supported the process. So that made the process a lot better. But I'll tell you, it made for a very difficult Christmas. And I spent a lot of time working on those answers and stuff. And then once the process got in place, uh, we then were told, well, in about a month or two, you're going to be confirmed. Well, that month went by, another month. And this is February, March, April. They said, well, maybe it'll be June. <laughs> so pop up, nothing happens in June. Al and I are calling each other. By the way, no one's calling you, telling you anything, by the way. I mean, there's no body saying, so George, this is happening. No, what you're getting is really what you see on the internet just like everybody else. So when, when you guys were calling me, I'm just giving you what you could have found on the internet. Okay, because I don't know. And so then, somewhere around August, uh, the Senate is about to leave and go on the recess for about a month or so. And we don't know what's going to, there's a rumor, you know, they may do something. I'm up at the ABA, I'm at the ABA meeting in San Francisco, and I'm looking at C-SPAN, which is the definitive way, because that's actually the Senate on the floor, waiting to see what's going to happen, and finally, about, about uh, 5 o'clock or so, uh, San Francisco time, 8 o'clock back here, a blurb goes on the bottom and says, Senate's about going to recess. In other words, if you've got anything you're waiting for, forget it. And so I get up and says, OK, it's over. And I start walking over to the Judicial Division event, <coughs> which is on the bottom level floor in the San Francisco place. It's huge. And I, and I told you I was the former <coughs> chair of this event, chair of the, the Judicial Division, chair of the appellate judge. I know judges all around the whole country in there. They all know me. They know I'm waiting. And so when you get in, they're all going, ah, oh, Jim, have you heard anything? Not a word. Not that, Jim. And then uh, 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 Judge Davis, who was confirmed for the Fourth Circuit, is there. He runs up to me, Judge Wynn is criminal. It's criminal what they're doing to you. It's criminal. And there's nothing I can do about it. So we're just waiting. And then I pull out, <clears throat> I get this buzz on, where's my phone around here? On my phone. And you know, you know what a Google Alert is? You don't got know what a Google Alert is. You put your name on Google Alert if you count in an office. And every time you get the news, something news from the other pop up on these things here. So I got these Google alerts going on, but it could be anything. You know, Judge Wynn didn't get confirmed, but you know, something else about Judge Wynn is never anything good. So I hit this thing, and I'm standing over in the corner. All this party is going on around, and and I'm sitting here reading this thing. It goes, Judge Jim Wynn was among a handful of judges confirmed today. No kidding. <laughs> so then I walked around, and David said, "What 
what do you got? Man, anything? I said, I don't know what it is. Let me go out and let me call some people. So who do I call? I call the U.S. Senators. So I tried to get over to Senator Hagan, and I said, Senator Hagan, I finally got her. And she's, she said, Jim, I'm on a car riding from Raleigh, from, from D.C. to Raleigh or Greensboro. We, I left early. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Guys know what it feels like to be kicked in the pants. That's what that felt like. I mean, I felt like double and over. So it's going to be so, you know, you can always keep up with stuff. And so then I'm calling around, I call up G.K. Butterfield, who's down in Florida with uh, Clyburn and that crowd down yeah. there. And, and I said, G.K., I got a Google alert that I was confirming that. He said, I don't know anything about it. Let me get Clyburn on it. So Clyburn, who's a majority whip, then calls up the people from the Senate office. And by then, the Senate is gone. Because I told you it was 8 o'clock when I heard this. Now it's 9 o'clock back here. And so it's still early there. And, Senate, and they can't get up with anybody. And so then finally, uh, Hagen's chief of staff calls me back, and he says, well, Judge, I'm not sure. Let me get on it. So he gets on it. Well, in the middle of all this, I'm trying to get it with Senator Byrd. And finally, he calls me. And Senator Byrd goes, congratulations, Jim Wynn. You were confirmed today. We got you through. And uh, he said, we didn't get through Al Diaz, but we will get him through in a couple of months or so. About then, I get the call from uh, the, the chief of staff back there. Judge, I'm not sure because I'm looking at the <laughs> transcript and the transcript doesn't say the word confirm. I said, I don't care what it said. Senator Byrd told me I'm confirmed. I'm going to take that to the bank. And, uh, so, you know, for all of those rumors about how you find out about this and you'll call for the president, that does not happen. <laughs> Keep your Google alert on if you want to know stuff. Uh, I, um, I think the, the experience of being on this court as opposed to a state court, what I like, Abe, Al, and those who practice law, Burton, I, I enjoy the practice of law, making the differences, but I often wonder why lawyers spend a lot of time telling war stories. And the reason is because if you don't tell those war stories, you will be forgotten. Uh, and many times you don't want to know the war stories. They were great stories. You want great cases. But unless they, you know, were Miranda type case, they don't remember you that way. Uh, but as a judge, what I've come to, to realize, even as a state judge, that one judge, you can write opinions that change the whole course of the state. People won't know it. And I wrote some decisions, one of which uh, was a dissenting opinion. Some may, Al, you remember, I wrote many of those, I'm sure, but one of which was a case in which someone came up with the wise idea that if you are convicted of reckless driving and drinking and you have to cause a death, maybe you should face the capital punishment. Now, mm -hmm. and I wrote a dissent that says, wait a minute, reckless driving is over 15 miles an hour. And I use the example, your grandma was driving her child on one of the roads there and happened to be exceeding the speed limit and she veered and caused an accident and killed someone Grandma could be charged capitally and executed. And this case went to the state Supreme Court and my two colleagues on the state court, who I won't tell you who they are because one of them is a good friend of you guys here anyway, and uh, they told me, they went over and heard the argument and says, Jim Wynn, I never thought I was so much against grandma. All I kept hearing was grandma this and grandma that and grandma that. But the Supreme Court reversed and went my direction and uh, Bob Orr wrote the decision the other way, and I, I gave him a hard time because I said, you changed grandma to soccer mom. <laughs> so if you read that opinion, it's my opinion, but it now says soccer mom did all those things. But I, you know, the difference of what one judge makes from dissenting opinions that ultimately the Supreme Court may go, but more so, you focus on the Supreme Court. Let me tell you something. The Fourth Circuit is one of 13 circuits in the country. It's one of the most powerful circuits in the country. And it covers those five states I told you about. Last year we did four or five thousand dispositions. How many do you think? Now, now, once we make a decision on the fourth circuit, the way to get it changed, maybe two avenues exist outside of taking it to Congress and getting the law changed, but that won't help that litigate very much. Uh, one is an en banc proceeding where the whole court sits together. And the other is taking it to the U.S. Supreme Court. And last year, maybe four, three or four of those cases went on bomb, and maybe three or four 
went to the Supreme Court. So that other 3,992 decisions stick. So that three judge panel you get, that's it. And here's the other kick about the Fourth Circuit that's sort of interesting. And every, by the way, each of these circuits have different procedural rules. And so things are handled differently. We do things differently somewhat. And one of them is that you don't know that panel until the morning. Until the morning of your case at around eight or so is that panel reviewed. And I know that's, 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 that's solid because some of you know I was on the affordable health care case. And on the morning of that case at about 8, 8.30, my computer exploded <laughs> because then they released the names of the panel. It was in every paper all around. But it was amazing to me, a case is important that you would not have known, but it was. And some of you know, too, that uh, I was given a very hard time after that case, particularly by the Attorney General of Virginia and others, because I was the only judge in the entire country, federal law circuit, who said that it was a tax. And of course, the end result is that's what the Supreme Court said it was. But I haven't gotten a lot of, of apology on that yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm for it. Uh, but I, I think that you know the court itself, the, the, the court of appeal, the, 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 the Fourth Circuit. What I love about this court is a tremendously collegial court. <laughs> Regardless of what you read in those opinions or how they can go after each other, they go after each other like you. There's no tomorrow. Because there's no diamonds on this court. They're very smart, smart people. And you see the kind of law clerks we have. I mean, this is just a, 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 just, just a part of what's going on out there. And it's, and it's amazing, the interchange and the exchanges that goes on on that court. But in a setting, a social setting, you would think they were all brothers and sisters. Because there's nothing but just true, just, just, just wonderful, genuine, warm expressions made on the outside. You just don't see it. You don't see any bickering going on in that court. Now, that's not true in every circuit. Some circuits, they're, they're, they're genuine problems. In fact, we just had a visit uh, because Senator Dale O'Connor, who's retired from the Supreme Court, sits in circuits from time to time, and she sits in our circuit virtually all the time. And for that very reason, uh, she just says it's just a place she'd rather sit. And I think the, the end result is that you can not agree to disagree. You don't have to play this out and live it in such a way as though this is the beginning and end of life with every case that you have and that there's a case that may go this way today. But for those of you who are involved in the process, sometimes a case is not really what you need to be pressing. You need to talk to your client, depending on who your clients are. Of course, the corporate defendants and corporate plaintiffs uh, in a whole different situation. They tend to be able to absorb it and move. The individuals don't exactly want to spend 20 years so that you can not press that issue that's going to come out bad and, and for everybody else. But you have to think about it in terms of as you move issues through the court system is how that case will affect other cases, which is something increasingly that comes to, to, to my uh, belief on. So how long have I talked, Rob? Am I You're doing good. At my limit here? So at some point in time, I'm going to entertain some questions. Uh, I will say my experience in Cambodia and Vietnam it is amazing to me what a wonderful system we got compared to other places. The beauty of the court system is whether you agree or disagree with the outcome is that at the end of the day, you may cry, you may yell, you may do whatever else, but you go home and you just go ahead and start your life again the next day. You don't go home and get a gun. You don't go and try to destroy the, the country or shoot the judge, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and that happens. That happens in other countries. And it amazes them when they hear, judge, you mean you can declare something unconstitutional in your country? Or you can say that the president was wrong on something? Or that Congress was wrong? That's foreign to them. That, they don't follow that in terms of what goes on. But it is your respect and your belief that sometimes it goes your way, sometimes it does not go your way. But that doesn't keep you from sticking with your principles and at the end of the day deciding, well, what do we have left and how do we now move? And I, I, I tend to believe in the belief that the pendulum 
only swings so far. Even in the worst of times, it does not, it only goes so far. I mean, that's probably why you got uh, cases dealing with the confrontation calls that have come out of the way. Nobody thought they were going to go in that direction on that case. But, you know, if it's gone far enough, or cases in which you might have GPSs attached to cars, you say, well, what's wrong with that? Of course, it's, what's wrong with it is you can do it to my car. And uh, so that's probably not a good idea to allow things like that. Uh, and that was not exactly their rationale, but <laughs> it was an underpinning of some of the questions. Uh, but the bottom line is, is that the work you do, I can't encourage you enough to keep on doing what you do. And if it's tough on you, then that's why we gave you the job. <laughs> if it's an easy job, we'll find somebody who doesn't work so hard. Because <laughs> easy job doesn't need people who can really work. But those jobs that are tough, we find the best to do those. And so don't, 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 uh, don't, don't complain about it. Take it as a compliment that it is. Thank you. Um, so I'm Andrew Blocky. I'm the um, director of the Legal Policy Program at a big um, cross-issue progressive think tank in Washington, D.C. called the Center for American Progress. And I'm really excited to be here, and I'm excited to see such a big group of folks. Um, some of what I'm going to go through may be familiar to you, especially the practicing attorneys in the room, some of which may not be, but may be of interest to you as sort of a, as people who are part of the broader progressive community. So I'm going to kind of move through this kind of quickly because I think the thing that's more interesting is to have some questions and some give and take. But I just wanted to sort of say from the outset, what we're here to do is to talk about an issue, the federal judiciary, that really doesn't get a lot of attention as a political issue, especially on the left. Over the last 30, 40 years in particular, conservatives have made a real political priority out of the courts. Getting judges, ideological young judges, even though that's my, maybe not what we want, on the bench and then using the justice system to get outcomes that they can't necessarily get through the legislative process or the electoral process. As a general rule, progressives haven't been as good or as well organized on that, and so we're kind of losing. And so I think that the point here is to try to engender a little bit more interest and urgency among the progressive community in working on courts. So this is just sort of a broad example of all of the different issues. Every single issue that you work on or that you care about, whether it impacts you personally or it's what you do in your professional job, ends up in um, federal court. This is just a listing of some of the issues that have been before the federal courts in the last several years. Environmental, uh, uh, religious, labor, marriage equality, um, some of which have already been previously mentioned today. What do these numbers mean? I'm curious if anybody has any sort of sense for why and what these numbers refer to. Judge mm -hmm. Wynn alluded to them earlier. Anybody have any sense? Anybody want to take a guess? Other than the law clerks. In the room. <laughs> so 78 is the number of cases the US Supreme Court heard decided last year. 55,000 are the number of appeals court decisions. So the court that Judge Wynn sits on and the other 12 circuit courts of appeal, there's 13 across the country. There's 350,000 cases that are decided by federal district court judges, like the one where there's a vacancy in the Eastern District of North Carolina. So if you just look at the numbers, there's no way that every single case can get to the Supreme Court. And there certainly are the majority of cases that are decided by the federal district courts in this country never get appealed. And so that's, your fi that's the final decision. And what we found and what we know is that most issues that people care about, the courts are sort of their last resort. Either something is wrong, and so you go to court to get your wrong righted, or people who are opposed to you can use the federal courts to undo what they perceive to be wrong. And so you're sort of saying, well, this, the courts are our last sort of guess. But I, my, my point here is that so much attention gets focused on the US Supreme Court. It's the lower federal courts where much of the work gets done and where much of the um, sort of the policy making happens. This is just sort of a pie chart that shows you the US Supreme Court doesn't even show up on the map. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to do is sort of highlight a couple of issues about why the courts really matter for issues that are happening right here in North Carolina and across the country, um, particularly as it relates to voting. Sharon mentioned voting earlier. These are just a couple of examples of types of cases that are currently working their way through federal courts. So there are challenges to voter ID laws in South Carolina, Wisconsin, and Texas. 
voter regi uh, registration restrictions. The federal court stopped the law in Florida last year before the 2012 election. Early voting, federal courts have blocked restrictions to early voting in places like Florida and Ohio. The US Supreme Court is currently deciding that the constitutionality of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which, as you probably know, requires certain states with a history of racial, uh, jurisdictions with a history of racial discrimination in voting from getting pre-clearance by either the Justice Department or a special federal ju uh, judicial panel before making any change to their voting laws. This is to go to um, the most fundamental right that we <coughs> as Americans care about. It doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. Federal courts are often the last say in who can and who can't vote. And just to sort of give you a sense, this is continuing today. All of the states here, it's a little hard to see on this map, but all of them are either red or pink. There's very few that are actually white. All of these states are states that since the 2012 election, so in 2013, have tried to enact restrictive voting laws. All of these, all of them will end up in federal court someday. So I just wanted to give you a sense beyond voting. Here in North Carolina, a couple of cases that are actually, um, that are sort of winding their way through federal courts, religious freedom cases, a challenge to the issue of sectarian prayers at county meetings, whether that's constitutional, um, uh, discrimination in terms of uh, policing, racial profiling, um, reproductive rights, um, whether uh, the state can uh, allow um, uh, pro-life license plates to be uh, made available without making some other pro-choice like um, license plate made available, and um, the question of whether um, gay, lesbian, bisexual uh, uh, couples can um, have the right to adopt their children uh, of, of their other spouse, even if they're not married, in the same way that, same se uh, that opposite sex couples legally are allowed to. These are issues that affect everything, everyone in our community. They're currently um, being um, under consideration in federal courts here. So why do I bring all of this up? It goes back to the point that I initially make. Uh, made. Um, conservatives, and particularly under the Bush administration, they were very successful at getting their judges on the bench. Doesn't mean that it's judges that decide their way on every single policy issue every time, but we know, and there's been studies that have confirmed this, including one recently by the New York Times that showed that, that President Bush's nominees to the Supreme Court are more corporate friendly than any in the last 60 years that they've actually had a real influence in changing the outcome of the law. And if we think that judges and courts are the last sort of you know, stand in all the issues that we care about, we really ought to care who's on the courts. Again, conservatives have been really good at this, progressives have. Um, this also translates into the composition of the federal bench in terms of diversity. Um, all, what this chart shows is that the, um, the, hot, the darker bars are the, sort of the percentage of the United States population that is of the different demographic we're talking about. So women, African American, Native American, Asian American, Latino. In all cases, the federal bench is significantly lower um, than the average um, sort of composition of across demographics in, in the country. Um, and we're making progress. What this chart shows is that under President Obama's uh, 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 judges, President Bush, uh, 43, and Clinton. Um, president Obama has done better than any previous president at actually diversifying the federal bench. And why is that important? I'm curious if anybody has a, uh, has a, a feeling about, or, or an opinion about why I'm even talking about this. Why is diversity on the federal bench important? Yes? Well, your life experiences influence how you filter and interpret the law in terms of its impact. So maybe you're not going to always decide on something just because you're a woman. You're always going to decide for the woman who planted before you, but that you're more open-minded to the arguments before you. <clears throat> and there's also something about the public feeling and having confidence that the judges and the courts are representative of the community that they're serving in, right? So you have a little bit more confidence in the idea that, you know what, I actually feel like even if I'm not gonna win, I at least got my arguments, got a fair hearing, I was treated, you know, fairly. Again, fair and impartial judges, we want people who have diverse life experiences and who bring an openness of perspective that we know that diversity brings. So we want a more diverse federal bench, we want judges who are fair and impartial, we need to care more. There's this map is um, showing you all, <laughs> all the places uh, where uh, it's, it's my slides are bad. I should admit it. 
these are, this is Maine, this is supposed to be the entire United States here. Everywhere there's a white is where there's not a judicial vacancy. So like everywhere else, it's like there's a vacancy. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere else. So uh, a chunk of North Carolina. We recognize here. Eastern North Carolina. <laughs> um, and what, what I wanted, the point here is that uh, 195 million Americans, and the population is about 300 million in the United States, 195 million Americans live in a district or in a circuit where there's a judicial vacancy today. So about 10%. That means there aren't enough judges on the federal bench to hear cases that are pending before them. Uh, we talked a little bit of the composition of the Fourth Circuit. Um, probably don't need to run um, through it, but here's some sort of stats to sort of help put a little more Google research behind um, uh, 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 Judge Wynn's comments and what he's talking about um, in terms of composition. There's no vacancies on the Fourth Circuit, and President Obama has um, uh, uh, nominated and got confirmed five of the current um, judges on the circuit. Here in Eastern, uh, here in North Carolina, on the district court, this big black box <laughs> here is the, the Eastern District. Um, there are, um, you know, it's sort of, I think this is all stuff that you already know. Um, there's only been one female judge in the history of the, of the district court, um, and there's really no um, uh, racial diversity on, uh, on the bench, even though this map shows you the sort of general racial composition of the state. So the darker areas here is where there's the highest concentration of African-American population, again, the point that Judge Wynn made earlier in the presentation. But there's no, there's no effective racial diversity on the, on the, in the Eastern District. So it sort of sets up a little bit of an of a issue that folks need to think about. The good news is that there are things that you can do. And this isn't just up to the senators, this isn't just up to the president. Um, on the table that you have before you is an is a in infographic that sort of tries to distill down into as simple a way possible what the nomination and confirmation process is like to become a federal judge. This is the process that Judge Wynn talked about, the process that he went through. There's a lot of politics involved in this process. But the good news is that when there's politics, that means there's politicians involved. And politicians are responsive to two things. One, one is money, and one <laughs> is votes. And the votes piece is what we're really focused on. The people, the Senate, senators, listen to their constituents. They really pay attention to what their constituents at home are thinking. So to the extent that there's a vacancy on the federal bench in your own community, senators need to hear about it and hear from you. Because if they don't, then they think that it doesn't matter and they can focus on one of the other thousand issues that they're working on. So our whole point here is that through varying points in this process, there are opportunities. There's roadblocks. At each point, you can sort of weigh in. Do some press, do some media, talk about the issue, talk about this with when you go to a town hall meeting. If you ever do anything related to public events that Senator Hagan or Senator Burr does, ask them about it. Get media attention on it. The point here is that there's a very small handful of people who actually care about the courts and who work on this stuff, and everybody hears from them all the time. The point is, if you're a progressive and you're working on a different issue, but you ask them about the courts, it's like a new voice, and it's sort of almost an unexpected validator that people really, you're, you're listened to. And this is very little impact um, that you can, uh, very little work and for a potentially really big impact. And just to sort of give you a sense of the, po the political uh, dynamics currently at play under the uh, Obama administration, President Obama has gotten 185 judges confirmed um, as of this point in his presidency, as of about this, uh, it was like last week, the fifth year in his presidency. As of the same point in his presidency, George W. Bush had gotten 205, Clinton had gotten 203. So as of this, this exact point in their respective terms, you can see Obama is lagging. And the pace tells you that that number isn't gonna like get better, we're not on track to catch up, we're in fact on track to like fall farther behind. On average, uh, President Bush's circuit court nominees waited 35 days on the floor of the Senate to get a vote. So after the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, approved, reported them out to the floor, President Obama's circuit court judges wait 140 days on average. Same thing for district court judges, 35 days and 104 days. 
district court judges generally are uncontroversial, have been under the, for the history of the Senate. Generally, it's like home state senators recommend judges. The White House will sort of um, uh, nominate. They go through the confirmation process. But generally, very few district court judges are actually ever controversial. Under this administration, the US Senate has been markedly slower and more obstructionist in, a, in, in confirming President Obama's judges. So again, this all means that when there's trouble, there's opportunity, particularly among progressives. And again, I cannot um, impress upon you enough what we hear tomorrow. I'm going to be at the White House, and they have convened a bunch of progressive advocates from different um, organizations and groups who work on youth issues and women's issues, religious issues, all of whom haven't really traditionally been involved in the courts, all coming to the White House to basically you know, learn about how they can be more involved in both helping get better judges nominated, but really getting President Obama's judges confirmed at the bench. Doesn't mean you have to like every single one, but the idea is we need judges on the bench who are gonna be fair, impartial, diverse, clear-minded, who can actually do the work of the American people who are depending on courts in many cases for the fair resolution of the issues that they most cherish and that are the most foundational issues um, under our Constitution. This goes to the right of people to vote, to participate in the political process, for the ability to make choices about their health and the like. Lots of things you can do. Happy to answer questions this is what um, Rob and others at um, NC Policy Watch do so well here. So that's what I have for you. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm sure Judge Wynn would be happy to take questions, but I just want to say one more time, I'm so excited that you're here. It's great to see such a wonderful room of people who are so excited about this issue. Um, and I really hope that you'll go out and tell your colleagues and your friends and your family about why this is so important. So thank you. I'm not sure what the best logistical way to have you both uh, address questions. I'm sure we'll have questions for both. Maybe you both should just come come on up, maybe just sure. and we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, if anybody wants to start us off, if you, John, go, go ahead. Then. I have a question for the judge. <coughs> comment about the re recent spate of assassinations of judges in the United States. Well, you know the whole issue of security in terms of judges, particularly federal judges, is a, is a big issue, and has been. What was making this more difficult, <coughs> some of the cuts that are coming from sequestration with the U.S. Marshal Service and the kind of protective services that, like we all have, home security systems, all of your chambers have the kind of security that's there. Um, you know, I don't know how you stop if someone wants to proceed to do harm to an individual because that individual has carried out their duties as a judge or whatever it is. I don't know how you stop it ultimately, but we can try to take some precautions on it in terms of being more careful and in terms of our home, our families, that sort of stuff. We've, of course, we've not reached the kind of situations that exist in other countries, but the fact that it existed at all is a, is a threat to the judiciary Again, irrespective from one's own perspective on, in, in terms of one's belief of one way or the other, it's a threat to everyone whenever you have that happen. Kate, in the back. Yes, I have a question for the judge. I wonder if you could comment, especially from your experience in the Northern District of New York, on the state court about the funding issue for courts. Um, I'm an attorney, and I just finished litigating a case where I estimated I spent seven months of the litigation just waiting for a hearing in the Wake County Superior Court, each hearing six weeks, seven weeks of delay because there are not enough judges, not enough court staff. So I just wondered if you could comment on funding issues and how that affects the judges' work and the, the work of the court staff and how it affects litigation. Tremendously, and I mean on both ends in terms of being able to pay attorneys who represent indigent defendants on the one hand and being able to provide access to justice in a meaningful way because as you increase the caseload for judges, you necessarily decrease the, 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 the opportunity to be able to move cases quickly. Judge Jones knows this better than probably any, anyone in this room in terms of just the sheer number of cases that come to us. And, and again, it's not going to get any better. Uh, you've got situations on the federal level got the Immigration Reform Act. Everybody says that's all a wonderful, good thing. Well, $6.5 billion of it is going to go toward increasing prosecutors, increasing investigation in it, increasing penalties and other things there, but no increase in terms of the number of judges 
only recently the Senate is beginning to look at increasing in certain jurisdictions, but immigration cases uh, probably for many jurisdictions now becoming like the number one case that they are seeing in terms of just the, the sheer numbers that are coming before the court and the issues that are coming from the court. That's just one of many examples, but you're hitting on something, and that is when you create mandates within the law for certain things to happen, and at the same time, you've got to look down the pipeline because, of course, the, 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 the court system is far more than just the judges. It's the probationary folks there, there's the investigators, there's a whole staffing uh, issue in terms of what goes on there. We couldn't do the work on our court. I told you we handle maybe four or 5,000 cases a year without a very significant uh, office of staff counsel, and yet that staff counsel is gonna be cut back significantly as a result of sequestration. So you know, some of those funding issues where the public does not perceive there's a need for those things to happen uh, come to surface. And, and some of it is real in terms of even federal judges. I mean, people look at, in terms of the pay issues, which judges have been talking about for years, in particular on the federal level, where Congress made the decision some years ago, they're just not gonna increase federal pay. So to be increased through cost of living, there's actually a lawsuit going through on the process now hmm. that dealing with where the federal, where, where the uh, Congress has denied the cost of living to federal judges, gave it to everybody else, and yet the Constitution says you can't decrease the amount of pay that a judge gets. How does that impact your, your, your courts? Uh, when I can tell you that my law clerks uh, will exceed my salary in, in a couple of years, and, uh, and, 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 and this one's telling me next year. <laughs> uh, and, and he's absolutely correct. Uh, that, and, and then once they've been out for a number of years, you're nowhere near it. And these are, are young lawyers who are just straight out of law school going straight into the practice. So when you're trying to hold judges in that kind of a venue with experience or get judges with that level of experience, you can get plenty of people to run for the federal court and seek the federal court. What you can't get is you can't get that criminal or crim to run that you really would like to have up there because they just can't afford to do so in, in an environment like that. And in many instances, they can't afford to stay. And that happens, of course, that has been one of the uh, uh, one of the offshoots, no matter what the ideology is, of judges who come to the court fairly young. Because what happens is somewhere in that process you got these, and you know, if you get that young, you got to be really bright. <laughs> and so they get these really bright folks come in young, and what they realize is they can't stay on this court because they got kids, they want to send those Ivy League schools and stuff. You can't do it on that federal salary. So they've been coming out, and we've had a number of judges to do that, to leave the bench and go into to another enterprise uh, as opposed to staying. I have a question for Andrew, which is, Andrew, do you think things have changed at all during in the last few years in the Obama administration? Is there a, did they come in maybe a little bit caught off guard by how much uh, obstruction there would be? Uh, or do you think it's just a, a function of our current divided politics that there's been so much blockage of their nominees? Well, you know, I think you have to remember they came in pretty early on and they had two Supreme Court vacancies that they had to fill, and that just takes a ton of political energy and time. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we've gotten, you know, uh, Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan on the federal uh, um, the U.S. Supreme Court, which are great. I think that um, as, a, as an issue, again, progressives, including a progressive president who's a constitutional law scholar as a lawyer, haven't made a political priority as much as I think they would have should have in the first term. People in the White House and the staff have said as much, um, and that's something that I know that they're reprioritizing in a second term. So I think that um, you know the DC Circuit, which we referred to earlier, um, which just decided a case invalidating President Obama's recess appointments to the National Labor Relations Board, for example, um, is uh, there's four vacancies on an 11 circuit, uh, or 11 uh, judge seat uh, court. Some of those vacancies have been open since 2005. President Obama is the only president in the history of the DC Circuit as it's currently configured, so like since President Woodrow Wilson, not to get a judge appointed and confirmed to the DC Circuit in his four, for full four years. He still doesn't have anybody. Um, president Bush got four, President Clinton got three, the first President Bush got like I think three or four. So I think that they just, it's a matter of political, energy. Um, there's been a lot going on. There was an economic crisis unparalleled in the modern era. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of excuses, but I think that there's a lot of energy behind this. And I think to the point, you know, judges are getting, the courts are getting hurt on the front end because there isn't enough funding to keep the courthouse doors open and to keep enough security and to keep paid staff to actually run the federal courts, even if 
judges themselves aren't being furloughed. There are staff in the courts who are being. And then on the front end, they're not even, the Senate isn't even confirming enough judges to fill the vacancies that there are, never mind the fact that there's probably already too much work for everybody or that there's young judges having to retire and the like. So it's sort of like from both ends, the political process is kind of extracting a real toll on, a, it's the third branch of government. It isn't just another political department. This is, you know, in order for our very democracy to function the way it's supposed to, we need actually the Senate to actually do, make more of a political priority on this. But let me add to that that not only are they not feeling the vacancies at the rate probably should, but the Judicial Conference, which is sort of the governing body by the Chief Justice and the Chief Judges of all of the different circuits, put forth a report. And in this report, they have proposed 70 additional judgeships be added that you, that you move like eight of the temporary judges over to become permanent judges, and then you create maybe 10 or 15 more temporary judgeships in addition to what's there. So the, the, the judicial conference itself has made that determination that not only should you fill these vacancies, but you need to in actually increase the number of judges to be able to meet the caseload demand that's uh, before the court. Judge Jones? I had a question for uh, this gentleman. Um, I, I started my career in the federal uh, arena. I was an assistant U.S. attorney. I was a law clerk twice, uh, appellate court and district court. And I watched the politics over the years, uh, all of what Judge Wynn uh, talked about uh, and his friend for many years, and I saw him go through it. Uh, and uh, I have the perception, I may be wrong, that when the, and I'm not trying to be political, but I'm just trying to, this is my perception that when the Republicans, are, when, it's, when they're on their watch, they have the presidency and they're nominating people, that their nominees go through much faster than the Democrats, you know, Devers and Flanagan and so forth. And then we get on our watch and we still have that vacancy. And, 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 yeah. and, then even, and, and, and same thing for the, for uh, the yeah. Court of Appeals. And, and why is that? I don't disagree and I think that the, it's the numbers. Yeah tell the story, right, in, the, in that particular case. The pace is a lot slower. And partly, I think, again, conservatives, I think, make more of a political priority of the courts. So there's sort of a joke in, in Washington sometimes that the only US senator to care about federal judicial nominations is Mitch McConnell. He's a Republican leader in the Senate, which is to say, like, he cares about not getting his, all of Obama's judges confirmed to the bench. So it's, it's, I don't think that there's as much political energy and political will on our side to care about the courts, filling vacancies, you know, using the, using the justice system as it's meant to be used to protect, you know, um, the rights, constitutional rights. I don't think that it's as much of a political priority as it is on the other side. And so that's what we're trying to do, is sort of help bring this up. And we know that senators feel the political pressure way more from their constituents than they certainly do from some guy from a think tank in DC. David and then Elizabeth. Uh, Andrew. I would like to hear more about what you hope or expect to uh, achieve from this meeting you're going to the White House tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, uh, after President Obama was reelected, uh, the staff, I think, um, senior staff in the White House, like senior, senior staff, probably from the president down, though I don't know, wasn't in the meeting. Um, decided that they didn't do enough in the first term on judicial nominations, need to prioritize it. So what they did is from January through about April, had a whole series of roundtable meetings at which they invited in progressive organizations that they had worked with on other issues, but that hadn't traditionally been involved in courts. To sort of do a basic like sort of education 101 on why this is important, what the process is like, um, to sort of get their buy-in a little bit more, to sort of say, the administration is making this a political policy priority you should too. You've worked with us on, you know, student loan debt on, you know, whatever the other issues are. Um, and so this is the second, this is the follow up to that. So they're bringing all these groups back to the White House to do more of a sort of in depth conversation, both about what the current state of play is, to share some of the administration's plans. And so next time I come back, I can share them with you. Um, and then they're actually all going to come to the Center for American Progress tomorrow, which where we and a, several partner organizations as part of a broader coalition who work on judicial nominations day in and day out are going to sort of have a strategy discussion with these groups about tactically, like what can you do? 
how do you integrate this into the work that you're already doing? Not just try to say, here's this whole new issue you've got to take on and add to all of your work, but sort of saying, you know, when you talk about an issue, see, see who the judge is who decided the case. Or talk about an issue and sort of drop, draw attention to the fact that it's happening. Or when you go meet with a senator, add it to the list of three or four things that you ask the senator or her or his staff to think about and to do. Making voices heard that are unexpected sort of allies or advocates on this issue is, I think, the goal. Then there's going to be another follow-on piece a few months later where they're trying to bring in folks from outside of DC because, again, the idea is that senators, and in particular the political process, are much more responsive to their constituents than any D inside DC people myself included, to um, sort of just talk about and strategize on how can we do, you know, how can we do this? So a really good example of this is in the Eighth Circuit in Iowa, um, uh, Jane Kelly was just confirmed in almost record time, well-qualified, progressive woman, people in Iowa, including the Republican senator who's the ranking member on the Senate Judiciary Committee, supported her nomination. The coalition of advocates on the ground in Iowa did a huge amount of media and support around her and her nomination, the importance of um, diversifying the bench, and, um, and it worked. Um, so there's areas all, all across the country. Texas is an example where there's a lot of vacancies and they're not moving nearly as fast. The political challenges there with two very conservative Republican senators, it's a challenge. I'm sure many of you know the history of the Fifth Circuit, not the most friendly to progressives and progressive issues. So I think that there's, some real opportunity, though, for I think the administration senses that they need to do more, and they're trying to bring in new advocates and new allies and to sort of have much more of an open conversation um, on the issue that they didn't really put enough political energy behind in the first term. Thank you. Elizabeth, Thank you. did you have a question? Maybe, maybe yeah. we'll get down to our last question or two. Well, just a related question, um, and Judge, good to see you again. This question is for Andrew. Um, sure. if what, what do, do you have, have you looked at how the uh, Republicans managed the 35-day versus our 140-day uh, gap. And, 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 is it, and did they do it this way, this wholesome thing that you just described, which seems like a really nice way to do it. But I guess I'm wondering, you know, what do we do? Do we find out who hasn't turned in their blue slip? I mean, there's not enough information here for me to go home and do something in my community, with my community. And I'm not sure that letter writing or phone calling is, is what we're talking about here. I think there might be some money involved. I mean, if you could just clarify, where are we going to see the blueprint for getting that gap closed on the number of days? Very good question, and I think it's beyond and bigger than any one organization. I think, as always, as anybody who's worked in the nonprofit space knows, funding is, sort of importantly. Um, I think that um, on the right, it is much more of a well-funded, um, they have a much more well-funded program um, around this. And I, again, I just think that it's a matter of sort of values and communication. And so conservatives really care about this. They make it a political priority. So what we're trying to do is figure out the best way that we can to have that happen. Happy to, you know, we can, get access to and information on who isn't returning their blue slip, where people are in the, in the process. My understanding is that there is a candidate in vet for the, um, for the Eastern District seat. You know, people do fall out of vet from time to time, so I'm, you know, until the person is nominated, and, you know, we don't know, but I, th I think it really is sort of <coughs> district by district or sort of geography by geography question, and it's a really good point. So one of the things that we're going to be doing for this second group of people who come in um, to town probably June, is to sort of have some state-by-state -state information. Some of our partner organizations in D.C. do this. I think it's a matter of disseminating the information so that you kind of know what the current state of play is, and I would be more than happy to follow up with you directly on, on that. Address. And there is a Thank nascent you. coalition that is sort of <coughs> coming together in North Carolina. That, well, if you want to contact me, rob at ncpolicywatch.com to express your interest in that. We'd be delighted to add you to the list. We've got... Uh, Sid, you want to ask one of those yes, questions? Yes, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Judge Wynn a question or, or and make a comment. Uh, I'm very much concerned about the integrity of the criminal justice system. This, uh, the, what I'm talking about specifically is the case against Crystal Mangum, the Duke of Cross victim accuser. Uh, the uh, medical examiner in that case made a, a blatantly false and fraudulent autopsy report on Reginald Day. 
Uh, I'm a retired physician, and I know that the statements that he made with regards to the findings and conclusion are totally false. I have uh, gone to the uh, mainstream media for more than a year, and they all know about it, but they are keeping it uh, quiet. They refuse to, 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 to investigate, they refuse to report on it, they refuse to editorialize on it. And uh, uh, I, I'm very much concerned about this, and uh, I, I would like to know what can be done. I've, I've, I've written letters to the Attorney General, uh, to, to the Governor, I've written uh, to, to judges, retired and active. Uh, I've done everything I could to, to bring forth this point. But, but uh, it seems that politics is, is playing too much of a role and it's depriving people of their, uh, of their, their freedoms. And I think that the reason they're doing this is, is, is basically twofold. One, to protect the, uh, the uh, medical examiner, who I don't fault. I believe he was coerced into, into doing this. And also to protect Duke University Hospital, because that is where uh, they're responsible for Reginald Day's death, because they intubated him in the esophagus. And, and so I was just wondering what could be done. Is it Dr. Hall? Doc, well, yeah, hard, right. Dr. Hall, right. um, what your question reveals is what I tell you when I hear and when I go to different events. And they, there are specific situations, specific instances. Some of you hear the question, you know, but you know Judge Wynn doesn't know the answer to that question. There is no answer to your question and you can give you a finesse answer. I don't do that. I don't do that to my friends when they ask me about opportunities for their children for, in terms of law. I don't do it to people who have genuine concerns. Whereas your question is one that's very expansive. There is no answer to your question that will help you specifically. I don't have that magic wand. But I'm going to tell you that directly, and I'm not going to BS you on the answer on it. But what you're dealing with is a system that sometimes things move, as I all know, glacially. And so the changes that you seek in the system, they're, they're actually greater than what you're talking about. You're talking about the Innocence Project that had 200 individuals who were about to be executed, and but for the fact that those particular jurisdictions had the DNA. Now understand that laws sometimes don't require you to keep that exonerating proof. And the procedural barriers of getting there differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And you and I know, we know this intuitively, that if there are 200 individuals plus that the Innocence Project has found were actually innocent, and by the way, they're actually out of prison. Yeah. There must be thousands in there who do not meet that same criteria, because primarily you're talking about people facing the death penalty. What about those that were confused of robbery or, or lesser crimes or whatever? And so the answer that you're talking about deals with some of the system and some of the intuitive reasoning. Guess what? In many, if not most of those cases, that was a confession. And you would think that someone who confesses must be guilty. It turns out they weren't. They had done nothing. <laughs> and it was only in that setting they're presented with this opportunity where, they, where the, a confession is extracted from them in a coercive way and it's proved later on to be that way. So what you're talking about is evidence and how you get evidence into court. And once it's in the court, what happens with it? Well, if you know that proof of guilt is beyond a reasonable doubt, everybody accepts, including myself, including Burton, including everybody in here, that that does not mean that you have to be absolutely guilty. There is a percentage that we all gotta accept. There's a percentage in every society. I mean, that's not something you wanna hear, but in every society there's a percentage where something goes wrong in that system and it's going to stay the way it is because that's the way the system is until you identify what that procedural problem is. And it may not be this case that it makes a difference to so maybe down the road. So find yourself a lawyer sitting beside one of the best there and let him continue to press your case and 
you know, keep moving forward. <laughs> but that's a difficult issue that has no specific answer that you're going to leave from here feeling good about it because you're going to leave with that problem. I'll tell you the antidote to this. I once said to my mother, my mother was a wonderful, wonderful, loving person, believing God and Jesus. And so I would go down and I said, Mother, I have all these problems when I come in. It's nice to be able to lay my burden at your feet. <laughs> and she said, Son, please lay those burdens at my feet. But when you leave, you pick those burdens up. And you go and with me. I hope you all have enjoyed this as much as I have. I hope if you have an interest in this matter and continuing work on why courts matter, feel free to contact us at NC Policy Watch. Read Sharon McCloskey's reports on the courts and law. And Keep the faith in these difficult times. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.